Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about benchtop supplies and my quest to replace the one I had for the past few years. Rather than taking the normal approach of just buying one that works, I decided to have a look at just how hard it is to build one yourself. So if you're curious, then keep watching. Now, it should be clear to any electronics enthusiast that having a benchtop supply is a very useful tool. You need something to power your circuits with. But especially if you want to keep things cheap, you will run into various limitations. The biggest headache that I've personally gotten is the output side noise. This thing that I have is a switching converter. And you can tell that just by measuring the output. Now, before I stuck my nose into it, it had around 100 millivolts of peak-to-peak -peak noise. That's quite a lot for my tastes. Now, cheap switching converters will usually be noisy. But a cheap linear regulator should be far better though. Now, I started working on an alternative multiple times in the past. Ran various simulations, ordered a bunch of components, even built a few test circuits. This particular board was built almost two years ago. And then promptly forgot about everything. Now, there's always another project to work on. But today is the day that I actually want to finish this thing, no matter how it turns out. I mean, I really need a low noise supply for some of the other projects that I'm working on. So my design goals are make it simple, it doesn't need to be fancy, it just needs to work, and soon, so this means cut any unnecessary and not simple to implement feature. The only things not off the list are low noise obviously, or at least lower than the current supply that I have, and that shouldn't be very hard. And secondly, the output needs to be adjustable down to zero volts. So how hard can it be? Now, my other main goal is to try to use some of the bunches of components I've collected and bought over the years for this project and for other ones that I never actually got to build. So it's always nice when you finally end up using things. So I had this box around for quite some time now. It used to be an old computer power supply. There was a time in the late 80s, early 90s that a ZX Spectrum-like computer was manufactured here in Romania. And this is the sort of supply it used. It's a five volt regulator built with the local version of the LM323, the Beta323. Anyway, this thing went through quite a lot, the electronics isn't very usable anymore, but the box is. So on the front panel of the device, I'll be adding a basic voltmeter ammeter, a set of output bananas, a potentiometer to set just the voltage, so variable current limit is nice to have but not really mandatory, and a switch to toggle the output and the main on off switch. And well, nothing else really fits on the front panel anyway. So this should do. So I sanded it, cut some holes and repainted it. I think this yellow white combination of paint is quite nice. And well, the box looks nice as a whole. Now, one reason I wanted to use this particular box was the size. It's tiny. Sure, this won't turn out to be some high power supply, but that's not really the point. I rarely use more than 1 ampere and 12 volts anyway. But desk space is always limited. So a small supply is a very nice to have. Plus it already came with this really cool heatsink with space for a TO3 regulating element. I don't know why but I really find this neat. Now a linear regulator is quite a simple circuit. First of all you need a power source, so this can be a transformer and rectifying bridge or in the interest of safety, you could go with an old laptop charger or something that already provides a DC voltage. So especially if this is the first circuit that you're working on, you should not play around with dangerous voltages. Then you need the linear regulator circuit, which ideally has at least a voltage adjustment. The main regulating element is some kind of transistor, which will normally need a heatsink. So the exact amount of output current will be limited by the cooling efficiency that you can provide. A way to express the output voltage and current is nice, so some sort of 
display interface is needed, you will need your output connectors, so through which you connect to the outside world. And well, other than this, I really want two switches. One to disconnect the main supply, and another to disconnect just the output. Personally, I find it very annoying when you need to remove the cable plugs or switch the main power off when you just want to not supply your test circuit. So with this particular switch, the supply will still be on, I will be able to adjust the output voltage and see the voltage on the voltmeter, but I don't need to unplug any cables from my test circuit. So the lack of this switch in most low cost supplies is a major inconvenience for me at least. Now this is quite a small box, maybe too small. It's a nice challenge though, getting everything to fit inside of it. Now for this design, the power will come from a basic AC power transformer. I got the storied one because of the small form factor, high power density and well, low noise. The power transistor will sit on the outside on the old heatsink. Now I just had to cut a bit off to make it fit in the new design. The elements on the front panel are quite large, so things like the voltmeter, the various switches, and the various connector plugs. So this leaves just a bit of space for the actual control circuit. This is the space in which the rectifier, the various capacitors, the regulator circuit all needs to fit in. And to make things somewhat easier to later service, I want to have the various interconnecting wires to go through a bunch of connectors. So these will also take up some of the very limited board space. Now, one important aspect for me about this circuit is that the supply should first of all be adjustable, but the range should go down to zero volts. That's easier said than done. So I found a few ways of doing this but each implementation comes with its own problems and drawbacks. Now, with the normal implementation of a regulator, regardless of feedback resistors or potentiometer, the output will always be equal to or larger than the reference voltage. This might be as low as 1.25 volts or maybe even lower, but that's still more than zero. So this specific approach is not good enough for what I want. Now, one part I came across was the LT3080. This is a component that is capable of zero volts of output, so it's specifically designed to be able to do this. And looking at the typical application, you don't really need a lot of extra components to build a regulator around it, so this would remove quite a lot of headaches. But it does not come in the TO3 package, so it has a bunch of other packages, but not the TO3 that I need for my fancy heatsink. So this won't do. Another method involves the use of a constant voltage load put in between the output ground and the circuit ground. This would provide the necessary offset, but there would be quite a lot of waste heat with this approach, since the current that is passing through the output also is passing through this offset circuit. Now, I did build this circuit to apply the principle, but never really got to use it or even test it out. Now at this point, going through the various components from my box of old stuff, I came across the LM723 in TO100 package. It's not the greatest regulator by today's standards, but it looks cool. So I decided to go with this part. Now looking through the datasheet of this particular part, you will notice that the error amplifier is completely separated from the reference voltage, which gives some quite interesting possibilities. For example, you can generate any reference voltage you want using a resistor divider. Now, even though this is not specifically mentioned in the datasheet, if you have a look at the internal schematic diagram of this part, you will notice that the error amplifier inputs can't really accept any voltage. So the input signal needs to drive at least two bipolar junctions. So the input voltage needs to be in the one to two volt range minimum. So you can't directly measure zero volts. One interesting approach I found was to use the error amplifier in an inverting configuration, where the sense value can go below the voltage on the op-amps input. In theory, you could have zero volts on the output, 
than the other end of this resistor divider would be at a high value, and you would still keep both of the op amps inputs above the 2 volt limit. This is the kind of circuit that I would end up building. Maybe it's worth mentioning at this point that the datasheet does explicitly say that the output cannot go below 2 volts. So unless you use some sort of multi-stage Darlington or some other way to lose the 2 volts, the inverting configuration trick does not matter. Although it's quite an interesting solution. However, because I wanted to keep things as efficient as possible, like use a PNP transistor as main regulating element to minimize the voltage drop, the method that I ended up using relies on having a low current negative voltage supply to which the regulating circuit is referenced to and then the actual output has an offset. It's similar to the idea of having the offset voltage using the constant voltage load, but this way the high output current does not pass through the negative supply. It goes back through the common ground. So problem solved. Or is it? Where do you get this stable negative voltage from, separate from the main high current supply? Now you can use a transformer that has multiple output windings that are outputting different voltages, but these are not usually easy to come by. The most common multi-output transformer will have two symmetrical outputs, but with this sort of arrangement, you don't really want to use one of the high power outputs just to output a few milliamps. Now one interesting approach that I found involves the use of a single winding, so here it's represented by a single AC supply, that first of all goes through a rectifying bridge to supply the high current, so on this upper rail, but then using a set of extra capacitors and diodes, so C2, C3 and diodes 5 and 6, generates a negative voltage. This can then be passed through some low power linear regulator to output the low power needed for the secondary voltage. So if we just run this schematic to see how it works, on the upper rail we see the two phase rectification, so this is there to output the high power for the main output of the supply, and then on the lower rail we can see that this is a half wave rectifying bridge, so you only see one of these steps every two steps on the top side, and while well, this goes through the negative voltage regulator to form a very nice, very stable output. Now for this design I will not be using this particular negative rail regulator, although you can, but I will be going with the LM7905. All the concepts and circuit bits done, it was time to start building. But I still had the issue of getting everything to fit into the box. After all, the entire circuit had to fit onto a 4 by 8 cm board. Actually, it's 4 by 8 by about 5 cm. That might help a bit. Now, one way you can divide the circuit is into bits that you know will never change, since there's probably no better way of doing things, and bits that you could later upgrade. So as with any design you make from scratch, there's always bugs. And once you really start looking into how the finished thing works, you'll get all sorts of improvement ideas. So that got me thinking. Looking into how a PC is built, you have your motherboard with the always same bits and various interface connectors, and then you have the socketed components and expansion boards. Things that you can later upgrade. So I decided to base my supply board on this principle. From the main schematic, there are two things that I want to put on sockets. Things I would like to play around with in the future, and then everything else is more or less fixed. Here I never expect changes. So the regulator circuit itself might end up needing changes to improve performance. And for the rectifying bridge, I do plan on trying out multiple versions, including active rectifiers. Everything else, like the large bulk capacitors and the negative voltage supply, or the front panel are more or less fixed. These will always be needed and there's not much to change about them. So this is the final thing built. I used the prototyping PCB for the main board, and this contains the various connectors and capacitors and so on. And then the rectifying bridge and the main regulator built around the LM723 is nicely socketed so it can be later upgraded. Now. The concept is done, the various components have been chosen, 
and even some of the modules have been built. Last thing is to put everything together and see if it actually works. But that is the topic for next time. For now, hope you got some useful information out of this. Leave your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for watching. Make sure to subscribe if you got to all my videos. And see you next time. Bye bye.